Teddy Wilson and his all-stars delivering Gus Kahn and Ted Fiorito's theme, I Never Knew, 46 years ago in New York City in the month of December. The soloists Bill Coleman, trumpet, Benny Morton, trombone, Jimmy Hamilton, clarinet, and George James baritone with Teddy at piano. And the theme, once again, I Never Knew. Images of Teddy Wilson and his all-stars. This project, begun by John Hammond, in cooperation with Teddy Wilson, gathered together in Los Angeles and in New York the cream of the musicians on the scene at the time for what were called the All-Star Sessions, originally created for Brunswick and later released through Columbia. In memory of Teddy Wilson, who made his mark, a man of elegant uh, style, who loved uh, elegant cars and would work on them, that was one of his hobbies, and Austin Healy's were a part of his scene. But aside from the automobiles, his art form at the piano was something special. He was both a teacher, he was on the staff of Juilliard, and a performing artist. As we uh, make our way down through these small hours, in memory of Teddy Wilson, this theme, Sunny Morning, Teddy's composition that always signaled his arrival on the music scene, broadcasting, and in person with his trios. sunny, optimistic style of Teddy Wilson. Several years ago, in one of our last conversations together, we had uh, met over the years, some 15 or 20, meeting like ships that pass in the night. We talked about the music business. of the piano, the orchestrator, and um, a man with a sense of economy, melody, and swing. Teddy, uh, there was a day in time, I think it was around 1935, 36, and 37, that you and John Hammond and others got together and cut some historic recordings, and it involved Billie Holiday. How did that all come about? Well, I have to give a lot of credit for that to John Hammond. It was his idea from the beginning to team uh, me up with Billy Holiday. Uh, and um, he uh, sold Brunswick in those days. It was Brunswick Records, uh, it wasn't Columbia. Brunswick Records, the idea of recording us. And it um, worked out to be very successful. And it's continued for several years, about at least, um, let's see, I think that, that association with Billy Holiday and myself lasted uh, until about 1939, from 35 to about 39. We made many records during that period, about, a, I'd say we made four songs a month, uh, roughly about that. And my job was to uh, contact uh, all the best musicians in New York who were available on that particular day that we had set for dates and record. And as a result, on those sessions, we had musicians um, from Ellington's band, from Benny Goodman's band, and Benny Goodman himself did many of them. And uh, we had from, uh, Chick Webb's band, whoever was in town at the time with uh, the musicians we liked. And since I was some of the favorite saxophone players, of course, were alto saxophone, Johnny Hodges did a lot of them, Benny Carter, Edgar Sampson, and uh, tenor sax was Chew Berry, Ben Webster, Bud Freeman did a lot, and uh, we had um, some trumpet players were Bobby Hackett, uh, Jonah Jones, Roy Elrich, uh, Frankie Newton, Irving Randolph, um, Charlie Shavers, oh many, Jonah Jones, uh, and most of the trombone was done, I, I think, all, most, but 
Benny Morton. I believe Benny Morton did practically all the trombone for all of those dates. And um, the drummers were lots of Joe Jones and Cozy Cole, Gene Krupa. Well, Harry James did some in, uh, uh, after about 1937, after he, uh, Goodman, he, he joined Goodman, because Benny Goodman did a great deal of the clarinet, and we had another excellent clarinet player from, uh, did some on the West Coast named Archie Rosati, a very good clarinetist. And the guitars were always either Al Casey or Dave Barber, uh, Alan Roos and um, uh, John Trueheart from the Chick Webb Band. He did a great deal of it. And the basses, John Kirby did a lot of the bass. Uh, and uh, Walter Page did a great deal of the bass. And, and Gretchen Moncure uh, did a lot of the bass. Moncure has a son who's got prominent in the uh, trombone, jazz trombone player. Just had the best, uh, and there was nothing like it because you might, in one session, you might have Johnny Hodges sitting next to Benny Goodman on one side and Roy Eldridge in the other, and uh, uh, Joe Jones on the drum. These were these were groups that could never be heard except in a recording studio. Financially, it wasn't possible for these groups to to uh, organize and play in public live. Only possible in a recording studio because each man was like the star of his own of some group or other. And that's what made the recording so interesting, too, because uh, where uh, maybe Roy Elrich might have been the star of, of Teddy Hill's band or so, but when he got in the studio, he was one, he was surrounded by six other stars. There maybe, as I said, Lester Young would be sitting on one side of him and, uh, and Benny Goodman on the other, you see. So it, they were all, really the first all-stars uh, recording sessions uh, where the public could really hear the best musicians in the world all gathered in one spot. And I guess maybe there, before that, there might, you might have to remember the, um, the Big Spiderback, uh, uh, Frank Trombo, Eddie Lang, Joe Venuti series, some of those all-star groups of fellows who uh, got together in studios and made exceptional jazz. Teddy, did, uh, did you select the material, that is, uh, the compositions that were going to be recorded on the date, or did you collaborate uh, with Billy Holiday on this? Uh, as well as the musicians involved? Yeah, but I tell you, we selected the songs. Every month, uh, the publisher would send Brunswick Records a stack of sheet music. Uh, Brunswick would petition out the, the songs to different uh, artists they had on the contract, the songs they wanted them to do. And when it came to me, they'd hand me a, a sheet, of, a, 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 a stack of sheet music, maybe with uh, 25 songs in it or so, 20, 25 songs, to pick four or two uh, two to four, at least two, to be recorded. They were brand new songs. And uh, then I'd go through the stack with Billy and um, find songs that we liked that would be suitable. And um, I thought the musicians could, uh, 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 might enjoy playing. They were adequate to play on. And uh, so that's the way it was done. But we didn't, uh, m most sessions, we didn't do four new songs. We'd do two new ones, and generally we'd stick in a couple of old standards. I might do three new ones, and uh, and one standard. How did you and Billy uh, uh, assess the songs? Uh, did she agree with you or vice versa? Yeah, well, she'd read through them. I'd run through them on the piano, and she'd read through them, you know, the lyric, and um, and we then we would put it aside, and we'd just go through the stack until we would settle on uh, uh, two or three songs. Generally, she would sing two songs on a session, and we'd have uh, two or three, and then we'd have two instrumentals with no vocals on them. And then you to set the arrangements and orchestrate. Yeah, and of course, uh, the first thing in setting an arrangement that time, we figured that the speed that it would be played, because we had a, uh, to go by, we knew it had to be a three minute limit. All those seven days were three minutes, so that meant we could do them like uh, two minutes, 50 seconds, two minutes, 45 to three, maybe three minutes, five seconds at the most. So that gave us something to go by. We'd set the tempo we wanted to do it, and then we knew what we were going to do. Uh, one and a half choruses, two and a half choruses, three choruses, four, depending on the tempo we chose. Any surprises when finally you got to the studio and took the first take? No, no special surprises. I don't quite understand what you, what your question there about surprises. Uh, well, you you did leave it open, didn't you? And there would be Johnny Hodges or Lester Young or Benny Goodman coming in for a solo, and of course their time was limited in the age of 78. Yes, yeah, oh sure. We, we, could, we could generally plan our, our, uh, uh, our arrangements without, without any difficulty because we knew where, where one course would be taken over the vocal, 
then the rest of it would be spread out among the, the, the piano and the horn players to, to be featured for maybe eight bars, 16 bars. See, in those days, fine musicians didn't need to play for five minutes continuously. Uh, uh, um, one of the greatest solos that's ever recorded by any, anybody was Benny Goodman's 16 bars on, uh, uh, on What a Little Moonlight Can Do, recorded in 19 to, uh, 1935. That's one of the greatest solos that's ever, ever, ever been recorded by anybody. And that, that, that solo didn't, I don't think it lasted over maybe what, 15 seconds. It's a, a good statement. It, it was a masterpiece. But somehow, over the years, musicians feel that that's not enough time. You have to play for uh, three minutes, four minutes, five, ten minutes, and some, some play one piece for an hour. But uh, to me, that's, that's not necessary. Certainly, Billie Holiday, working in this environment with all these inspiring musicians, uh, uh, presented her artistry. And how did it seem to go as you saw it from the keyboard and your beginning, choosing the music and then going into the studio and recording it. Her uh, satisfactions and her uh, rewards. And well, later, to be honest, the, the, the collaboration with Billy was very advantageous, even to this day. Uh, a lot of people know me because of that association with Billy Holiday. Movies have been made about her life. But I don't feel as a singer that Billy was in the class with those instrumentals. I don't think she was a singer like Benny Goodman was a clarinet player, or Roy Elvis on the trumpet, or Chew Berry, and Ben Webster, and Lester Young and uh, uh, Bobby Hackett, those, those, those fellows, to me, um, well, I, I, would, I, I preferred a uh, uh, musician singer. I, I liked uh, Ella, but John Hammond, uh, he was adamant, but Billie Holiday was his singer. He didn't like many women singers. He liked Mildred Bailey and Billie Holiday and Bessie Smith, and that was it. And that, of course, uh, presented some limitations. <laughs> yeah. But Billy, I would have to give Billy credit. She was a stylist. She, Billy Holiday could sing for five seconds, and everybody knew who it was. She sounded like nobody else. But um, but I wasn't particular uh, uh, that fond of her singing. I like singers like uh, well, Sarah Sarah Vaughan is one of my singers, or the girl who was with my big band, Jean Elridge, is one of my singers. And for ballad singing years ago, I used to like Ethel Waters, early 30s and late 20s, the way she was singing. Uh, and but. Billy was not a special uh, favorite of mine. Good, good singer, though. For, uh, for Ella, for example, what did you admire about her? Well, Ella had the, um, well, had this, this, this wonderful ability that, uh, like horn players in her singing, the, the intonation was perfect, her rhythm was just out of this world, and uh, her taste in rhythm, rhythm singing, and her scat singing was, was, um, just very special, I thought, and uh, but I don't. I never thought Ella projected lyric that uh, strongly, though, in especially in ballad songs. And uh, uh, well, none of the singers did in those days. They didn't project lyric really, except. Uh, uh, that's one thing I think that Frank Sinatra got so big later on in the early forties because he began projecting lyric. Now, uh, um, Russ Colombo was projecting lyric back in the early thirties when he came up along with Bing Crosby. But to me, Crosby wasn't projecting the lyric. He was projecting the melody line and doing a good job of that, and that was sufficient. But uh, Ethel Waters, back at her, if you hear some of her records back in the 20s, she could really tell you project the lyric and the melody. Uh, that was some of the best ballad singing there's ever been. I think Sinatra came up in the 40s, with, uh, the late 30s with Tommy Dorsey, projecting both lines. Uh, Teddy, thanks very much for uh, giving us insight to uh a period that was certainly marked in history as a very glorious time between 1935 and 1939. Your sessions in collaboration with John Hammond and all those marvelous colleagues. Good to talk with you. Thank you, Leigh. Thank you. <laughs>